Yeah, thanks Sydney for, for inviting us and we're happy to sponsor this, um, this gig uh, for the first time. So, very nice. And uh, that I can, could have convinced our marketing to throw out some money because I don't have any. Um, so, we are very happy. Uh, yeah, I put together a little presentation, like the state of containers that I think I provided like the last three times or four times. So that's the Spain, Spanish edition, the September 2018 edition. Um, and I'm a little bit, I was sick last week, so um, I, was, I was hoping to have much more to show, but still we have, I have cool stuff to show, I think, but still, still the case. But yeah, next time it will be even cooler, I think. Anyhow, um, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm Christian. Uh, I used to work in the HPC and CAE environment space. I used to work for Bull even, I worked from the Exascale Interconnect. And uh, when I worked for Bull, I started using Docker in version 0.7, which was like half a year before it, after it was uh, released to the wild. So I'm kind of an early adopter. And since then, I tried to um, get HPC or HPC data centers and containers together. And this was one of my first presentation I gave at ISC 14, which was um, yeah, back then it worked, but if I look at it now, I was like a little bit scary what I did. But anyhow, it worked. I used containers as everyone, I think, starting with containers. I used containers more as virtual machines than uh, containers per se. So there was a lot of evolution involved. And after, in 2015, I joined a little startup in Berlin because I kind of, I wouldn't say got sick of the HPC community, but once I... I attended an HPC uh, workshop in China and at the end there was a panel and uh, the panelists were asked whether they think they can learn something from the cloud guys or the cloud guys can learn something from HPC and every panelist said no no we cannot learn everything from the cloud right and, and I said and I, I recently learned docker and all the good and wonders that it brings right and then I was like wait that's kind of I think it's wrong so I, I said maybe I should uh, tip my toe into the cloud world and that's why I started this little startup and worked on the containerization of the PlayStation Now um, backend and recently or one year ago I started uh, at Docker and now I, I have my first year, uh, anniversary coming up like next month. Feels like four years. Anyhow, um, but yeah and, and now that I work for Docker I, I have a a better name on my business card because before I used to work for I said for PlayStation and then if you talk to HPC people about PlayStation they say oh, why why should we even talk to you and now of course it's even better okay um, I have a couple of slides about the technology recap I, I shortened it down um, because I think I gave this talk as I said like three four or five times and I think by now maybe everyone have heard about containers this is the slide without all the animations, so I think we know about traditional virtualization with a hypervisor in between, and we have the same or well, different kernel and user land, so we can stack different operating systems on operating systems below. And this we all know. In container land, it's a little bit different. We don't have a hypervisor. We don't have an additional kernel for each and every um, guest, so to speak, we want to run. Um, in container land, the host kernel is used by all the containers and the interface is syscall. So having this interface, I said interface, I have an interface view as well. So the left hand side is the traditional virtualization view where an application, maybe a Python script, uses Python to talk to the kernel, to talk to the hypervisor, to talk to the hardware. And in container land, we just package the application piece with maybe with a library or the runtime. And then this container can directly talk via syscalls to the kernel of the host, which makes it, of course, a little bit more slick. Uh, and um, yeah, and a little bit more performant because you don't have this intermediate layer. Okay, let's have a look at uh, two aspects. I, and usually this is also a little bit longer, but I want to focus only on the namespaces on, on the file systems. So when you start a container, you get all namespaces that the kernel provides, and the namespace is basically an Excel sheet about resource mappings to a processor, a process, right? So if you start a Linux host, you have namespaces already, but you only have one namespace. And the easiest one to think about is, I think, the process namespace. So if you do ps minus ef on a host, then you see all the processes that are running on the host, right? If you do this in a container, you can only see the processes that are associated with this container, because the container gets its own pit namespace, which then uh, only constitutes 
the, the processes that are running within this container. From the host perspective, the host sees all the processes as well. So if you do PS minus EF on the host, you still see all the processes that are running within all of the containers as well. But from the container's perspective, you can see only the processes that the container um, yeah, runs. And, and this is true for all the other namespaces. I mean, the net namespace, for instance, provides you with a loopback device, with, an, um, with a TCP IP stack, with your own up table, with your own routings, and so on. So, um, and by doing so, it kind of feels, when you first encounter it, it feels like a virtual machine, because you, can, you are isolated from all the other, the rest of the system. Even though it's not a virtual machine, it's just isolation from the kernel level. OK, and, the, and this is when, it, when this virtualization, uh, virtual machine model breaks. You can share namespaces. So you can start a container that uses the network namespace, for instance, of the host. So you have the same host name. You have the same network interfaces. And you have the same IP addresses as the host. So you don't have any distinction between the host and the container network-wise anymore. And you can do this for containers or between containers uh, as well. So you can start two containers using all the same namespaces. And then it seems like these two processes are running on the same, in the same container or in the same, because they share all the same namespaces, but they um, use um, yeah, do different file systems, but they use the same resource isolation. Anyhow, OK, any questions on this one? I think that's kind of clear. And I, I said there are a couple of presentations where I, I go deeper into this, and I show a little example, and a scary example as well, where I execute a container using entering all the namespaces of the host, which then is basically SSHing into the host as root, which kind of scares a couple of people, but that's possible, right? You can enter all the namespaces. And I, I have a couple of presentations about this uh, on the web as well. Another aspect to this is the storage driver. So if you create a container, um, it's different from creating a virtual machine image, right? A virtual machine constitutes of all the things, like all the operating system stuff, and all the, the kernel, and all, everything that you need to run this um, image on a, on a physical or virtual hardware. With containers, you only care about the application, and you have a very limited um, yeah, base image. If you, if you choose to do so. The, limit, the most limited one would be an empty file system, and then you just put a binary that is statically compiled into the container, and this is able to run as well. Because if you think about this interview, interface view I showed before, because the container does not need anything like systemd or whatever to, to run, it's just the application that then interfaces with the kernel. And if you have a statically compiled uh, program, you can just put it in an empty container and run it because it will interface with the kernel and issue syscalls against the kernel, and that's all you need. And this is how it's. And this is an example of a Docker file here. So I, I, I inherit from the parent Ubuntu. I set a, an environment variable. Then I run apt-get update, and I run apt-get install to install CUDA, and I move something around here. And then I set some other uh, metadata here. And as you can see, this will const uh, this will create an image with three file system layers, first the parent, <coughs> second is upget update one, and uh, third is upget install one, and they add additional, um, additional, um, yeah, additional meat to the, to the bone, so they add additional um, file size to these different layers. And all the metadata goes into the JSON. And this is a file or a, a, a Docker image that is uh, compliant with the OCI stack, uh, with the OCI spec, so we have uh, contributed our runtime spec and an image spec to um, the Open Container Foundation, or Open Container Initiative. So um, this is all open source and, um, and used by the container community, the broader container community. So once you start this guy here, so you do docker run minus ti to have an interface, to have a, a terminal, and to be interactive, you will create a container um, file system out of all the image layers that are in the image. So we have this image layers here, the three ones that are inst instantiated for the container to run. They are all read-only, and if you do a container run, as I showed it here, you will create a little container layer that is read-writable. And so if you do something within the container here, so I echo the environment variable and put it into root test, this will create a file. Oh, and I have a a pointer here. So this will create a file here 
Uh, so this H stands for add in this layer, and it will also add the bash history because you executed a bash program, so it will create this bash history uh, automatically. And, um, and this is the changes that were done to this read-only layers that are created for this container. What I would like to see, but this is like best practice, I think, um, and I think that's especially best practice for HPC and AI workloads, that everyone is using read-only. So with read-only, you just instantiate this read-only part, and you do not, you are not able to change anything within the file system of the container. You can mount volumes from the host, you can mount the home directory, for instance, or you can mount the scratch file system. And of course, for, to this, you can read and write, that's no problem, but um, you cannot change anything within the container. I think that's just, uh, generally speaking, a good idea in uh, HPC and AI workloads. And it's also a good idea and best practice for enterprise workloads like microservices, but especially here, I think it's, it's very nice. Because then you can make sure that you don't overwrite binaries, that no, no one changes with this entry script or little, uh, uh, little run script. It changes something within the container. You can make sure that this is like integer and, and, and it's, not, it's not changed. Anyhow, so this is like um, namespaces, a short recap, and, and file systems. And if we put all of this together, I just want to run quickly through the stack that we are using or Containerland is using to create containers, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. The very simplest and, uh, and, and lowest level that you, you use when you run uh, Docker containers is run C. Run C takes this root file system I described in the storage graph uh, piece. I said when you create a container, it will create a directory with the root file system of the container and it will use the config JSON that I showed as well. And these two things uh, added to or uh, executed by run C will just create this interactive container. So you can do this on your own. It's a little bit cumbersome because you have to extract everything, but it's rather simple. You do run C uh, start and it will create a container. And this is the basic building block underneath. On top of that, and, to, and this is the OCI compliant runtime. It's the first OCI compliant runtime that, that was created. It was our reference architecture. Shifter, Charlie Cloud, Singularity, they are not OCI compliant, right? So you cannot use plain Docker images or plain OCI compliant uh, images and run Shifter Singularity or Charlie Cloud. You have to download it as they all do. You have to download the image, extract the file system, and then put it on SquashFS, put it on a shared file system or whatever to be able to, to run this. Um, on top of RunC, we use ContainerD to use the runtime, so this is like the runtime that I just showed. It could be any other OCI compliant runtime, so it could be Gvisor, it could be uh, Katak, or whatever, different uh, container runtimes out there. And what Containerd does, it provides the basic framework to create containers, start containers on the load. So it will download the image from Docker Hub or whatever, it will uh, create the snapshots of this file system, it will um, hand this over to RunC, and it will also provide a gRPC interface to, to control all of this. It will also provide some metrics, and it will make sure that this container uh, is started and it's running. But it's only simple stuff on the host itself. And this tool is then used um, to, to interface with um, by the Docker engine. The Docker engine has a lot of other stuff that it does, so it creates a network, connections, connectivity, so more advanced network connectivity. It allows you to have remote storage attached to the container. It has a couple of plugins that you can use, and I, I don't want to go into all the details, but essentially what it uh, does, it provides more um, advanced features than ContainerD and RunC can provide on their own. And if we put everything together, like this operating system view, so I showed you some namespaces real quick, and I showed you the Slayer capabilities, I didn't show C groups, but anyhow, so these are the three pieces that are needed to run a container. They are used by RunC and ContainerD, and on top of that, we have the Docker engine using this to create containers. And on top of this Docker engine, of course, we have all the, the goodies, the client, compose file, Docker registry, and all the, the ecosystem that is around the Docker engine. And this is kind of where Shifter, Singularity, and Charlie Cloud are living. They are able to download images, so they are more than Run C because Run C cannot download images. They are a little bit more than Container D, maybe because they are also 
do some more advanced stuff than container do is doing. So it's in this area, I think maybe blurring a little bit up to the Docker engine. It's yeah, they they are all a little bit in this in this realm. And what they are, of course, what they are what they are is uh, a user namespace container, right? You, so you you create the container with root privileges because you have to create an overlay file system, but um, once this is done, you can do singularity run or exec thing run, and you create this from the user perspective. You create it as it's just a wrapper, right? A wrapper around binary. So it's just a little packaging mechanism, and uh, it's it's not it's not this descriptive and API driven thing that we have this REST interface on top of the document. Anyhow, on Windows, it looks the same, basically the same. Um, Windows now has this host computing service. And they have C groups, namespaces, and layers. They, of course, call it a little bit different, but essentially it's the same. And um, yeah, so you can also run Windows workloads. OK, but that, that is a recap, um, a very short recap. Let's look at the challenges we face in uh, HPC and AI. So, first challenge is the second challenge. I mean, they're both, I think, equal challenges. We have to work on shared file systems, and we have to mimic and we have to um, provide the uses, the use that, uh, the use case that um, scientific use cases or scientists uh, expect. So, for instance, everyone expects when you lock into a, a login node or you lock into a compute node or you're scheduled on a computer node that you have your home file system, that you have your scratch file system, that you have all the file systems that you expect to be there, um, that you are your own user ID, right? So that you, Bob, you are Bob and not uh, Alice and that you can only access what you're allowed to access. So there is no, there is like no explicit constraint. Everything you can do, you are allowed to do, but there are a lot of like restrictions or a lot of uh, barriers that you cannot cross and, and uh, you have a lot of freedom, but there are certain barriers that you cannot cross and these barriers are hard and they have to be enforced. And, um, and that you have a scheduler that is all able to instantiate multiple ranks for MPI um, on multiple nodes and uh, let them work together using InfiniBand or using um, TCP IP maybe, or Rocky, let's say. And this, this is possible um, on the host. And also what a couple of uh, science uh, labs doing is having a, a, a Docker cluster, a service cluster, um, to allow the scientists to create a service that maybe um, uh, monitors intermediate results in the scratch file system and displays it to the scientists so that they can have a look at the intermediate results and decide maybe whether it's worthwhile to continue with the job or just finish the job. Um, the problem here is that the, currently the engine does not guarantee UID and Git ID, group ID mapping within the container, right? With docker run minus minus user, you can provide any user ID and any group ID to the container and the engine will will uh, execute it happily. I mean, you can constrain this, of course. You can make, um, you can disallow this, so you can prevent someone from um, creating a container without his, um, with, with a different ID, but it's, it's a binary true or false decision, and it should be that the user is enforced um, by the engine. So if, I'm, if I have Bob and if I have Alice, I can run the processes as Bob and Alice within the container, and then they can um, execute Bob and Alice uh, or ex, um, um, access Bob and Alice home directory if I just map into the home directory. But what I can also do if I don't have any cons constraints here, and this is designed, a uh, work that's designed, I can, if I'm Bob for instance here, and I run this command, and I, I post as, as Alice for the user ID and for the group ID, I can touch something within the home directory of Alice, and it looks like that, uh, at the end it will look like that Bob and that Alice had, had put this file there, right? So that's, but this is works as designs, right? This is how, how um, the engine is, is set up as of today, and we are working on uh, making this uh, not possible anymore so that you can constrain the use and you can make sure that if Bob starts a container, that his user ID and group ID will be used instead of anyone else. And if he tries to use Alice's user ID, it will be overwritten. And user namespaces can go can come for the rescue here as well, but user namespaces they will, will uh, introduce some other challenges, and we are working with uh, a couple of uh, file system vendors to maybe uh, have this this um, overcome. So what user namespaces do is they create an, 
an offset of the user IDs to a distant user ID range. So if you start with user IDs, you can say, if the user within the container is zero, offset the user ID with 100,000, and then uh, the container internally thinks he's root and he can access all the files, but for the kernel, this user is user ID 1,000, at 100,000, so it's an unprivileged user and uh, it, won't, it won't do any harm uh, outside of the container. And if you are user 1,000 within the container and you have an offset of 100,000, then you will be 101,000 for the kernel. And we are working with file system uh, vendors to do the mapping back, so if you have an offset of 100,000, that every file system I owe to the home directory maybe, is mapped to the container, to the user that started the container. So no matter what user namespace offset you get, Bob will start a container, he will be offset by 100,000, but the file I.O. will always be Bob's user. So you can uh, mitigate this mapping challenge. But anyhow, that's uh, a little future talk. Another challenge, of course, is being host specific and not host agnostic. As I said, Cloudland is where containers come from, right? And they want to run everywhere. They don't want to care about the underlying file systems or the underlying, um, underlying host so much. They want to be agnostic as to where it's scheduled so that it can uh, be it's portable and can be moved to whatever it's needed. But, of course, for HPC and AI, this is, uh, yeah, not, no, this won't cut it because we need to make, sh make use of uh, NVIDIA GPUs or or Intel or uh, Mellanox uh, network cards, so we make sure that we, we can use kernel bypassing technologies to use devices that are on the host. And also that we can um, mount directories into the container that, that are based on the, on the host and not a general thing. Because maybe you have two clusters schedule to schedule your, um, your, your container, and in advance you do not know whether the project directory is mapped under slash project or slash proj. So it, it's a host decision what you need to map into the container by default. And this comes down to making sure that a scientist using a container has the same look and feel as a scientist using a bare metal host. He logs in, everything is set up, everything is mapped to the correct place, so he's able to, to start working. And even worse, if we have different GPUs on different nodes, we need to make sure, or different amount of nodes on, on different hosts, we may need to make sure that we can map in um, the, uh, the GPUs into the container from a node perspective, and, from, and it should be a node decision. So, and my argument, internal and external argument, is that once we start AI and deep learning, and I think that's all the jazz, right? Everyone's talking about deep learning. Everyone wants to use deep learning, and uh, a lot of folks uh, um, yeah, are getting to us and asking about how can I use uh, deep learning, like Jupyter Notebooks using TensorFlow, for instance. And we are currently in this stage where we are on the edge of non-GPU, and we are getting into the beginner stage where we allow device pass-through. And there are techniques, and I will show a little example later how this is possible already. Um, but I think there are three stages. So first, you have a single node and very stupid local storage. So you have only 50 megabytes of cats and dog pictures, and you, you uh, have two GPUs in your node, and it's enough for you to run your deep learning workflow, right? So uh, it's, you, you can dump your model on the local disk as well, and you can get it wherever you want after the fact. So that's a very simple first step. But once your models get too big, or um, and, and you need to dump this model into onto a shared file system, like I discussed before, like maybe your home directory or project directory, you need to make sure that you are able to work with shared file systems so that the mapping of the home directory and, and other directories is done by default by the node, and also that you are you make sure that your user ID and group ID is enforced by the engine so that Bob is only allowed to access uh, the storage that Bob is allowed outside of the container as well, so that you are not able to uh, mess with the file system. And as shown before, by default, as of today, um, this is if you use a Docker socket and not UCP, and I don't want to, to bore you with sales slides, but uh, of course we have a cluster offering, but anyhow. Um, it needs to be uh, ensured that the shared file system is honored, that's all I'm saying. And once you exceed this step of single node, so maybe you have two GPUs with 8 gigabytes of memory each, and your model needs 20 gigabytes, 
you need to expand your node count, right? You need to make sure that you can use multi-nodes uh, and shared storage and most likely use MPI or you can use Arcuda as well for, for, for starters, but for now a lot of people use MPI here. And once we have MPI, shared file system and device path resolved, we are essentially at an HPC stage, right? So that's my motivation slide internally and externally to figure out HPC uh, use cases while we are at it anyhow, because eventually everyone starting with GPUs and with deep learning will end there anyhow. Because now you, for this use case, as of today, the shared file system use case is not solved by, by others. Uh, it's not solved by Nvidia Docker, for instance. Um, it's, and, and the MPI use case is also a little cumbersome. But if we focus on all three steps, then we will end up supporting HPC use cases. And I think that's uh, where I would like to, to go. And currently, you have these big systems like DGX2, which costs you like 500k or 400k. You can still be in this beginner step because you have a single node. You have a massive single node, but you have a single node. And you don't have to mess with MPI because you have so many GPUs in your one node. And this is where we are today. OK, just to motivate a little bit uh, from ATH Zurich, uh, Thomas uh, Thorsten Höffler, he did a study last year, or this year, I think last year. Uh, and he, he showed that, OK, GPUs, of course, are the um, dominant um, uh, accelerator. And also, it, more and more papers, and this is about um, uh, scientific papers, more and more papers are using multi-nodes now. Of course, because it's much cheaper to have 10 nodes with two GPUs, or let's say eight nodes with two GPUs, than one node with 16 GPUs, right? Um, and you have a sweet spot there. Okay, how can we use devices and how am I time? Oh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, that's fine. Um, if you want to use a GPU, and this is just the, the basic thing, you can do docker run minus minus device. This will be translated to a so-called Docker object within the engine, which is a bunch of JSON providing this piece here as well, so including this. So you have a pass on the host, you have a pass on the container, and you have some C-group permissions. Um, from this Docker object, we will create an OCI runtime spec. This is this piece though. It's also just a bunch of JSON, basically. And uh, it has some, some more information than this. And this is then handed down to RunC to execute the container. That's basically what it is. NVIDIA did some, some tricks um, in the last two years or three years. They came up with NVIDIA Docker, and the latest version um, includes or introduces to this OCI runtime spec, introduces another option here. This is a pre-start hook. And, and it's not a bash script, it's a binary. But um, this will be started once the container is created. So you do Docker start what, or Docker run. It will create this file system. It will create all the namespaces. And before the process is started that you specified, this uh, tool will be started with privileged execution within the container and all the namespaces. So NVIDIA can do all the magic that NVIDIA Docker does. It, uh, it figures out what is the GPU that is currently on the system, how many GPUs are requested by the user, um, where to put the CUDA library, and so on. So all the magic is done by uh, this little script or little tool. And, uh, and it's just a wrapper around RunC, or just a wrapper around RunC, but it's, it's just altering the uh, OCI runtime spec. And they do a lot of magic there. Um, one of our engineers, Michael Crosby, he created a container D patch, which is already in upstream, uh, that allows for some of the logic from NVIDIA Docker to be included into container D. Um, and I did a little engine hack, which I call Houdini, which intercepts this uh, command, this uh, client API call, and I just alter this um, Docker object and put all the, uh, uh, some of the magic that NVIDIA Docker does into this um, engine piece, and it's just a very crude but, work, but working hack um, that just uh, messes up, or messes with the Docker objects to allow uh, usage of um, the, the GPUs, because I think that if the user is not able to use it, so if it's in container D, you cannot use it really because you cannot run it or use it with Docker D, but if it's in the Docker engine, then you can use it. So I wanted to show that it's possible to hack it. And it was an uh, internal hack week project where I came up with this idea. And I think I'm in version 20 now, so I'm iterating with a couple of our customers towards, uh, towards a good implementation that everyone can use. Okay, and this, as I said, is just messing with the container run command 
and uh, making sure that users can use GPUs. But there's a better way. And this is what I figured out like the last two weeks or three weeks. So in set, I'm, I'm, one week I was knocked out. So I worked two weeks uh, every now and then I, I, I put some, some effort in it. And it is, I mean, I'm, I'm a Go nuthead a little bit. My Go code is not perfect, but it works. And what you need to do to mess with Docker and with Kubernetes is just run some, some Go. And um, what, is, what I'm doing here is I create a, a, a job, a batch job within Kubernetes, which just does NVIDIA SMI minus L, so list all the NVIDIA, all the GPUs. I um, issue this against Kubernetes management, which is a bunch of services like uh, the, the API and the scheduler and so on. And so on. Anyhow, so I put this, I want to run a batch job into the uh, management of Kubernetes, and the kubelet, which is the agent that is running on the host, will uh, get this and execute the container um, on the, and, and will execute it on Docker D, right? So you will start a container here, and if my engine is running, my Houdini engine, then I hack this one, and this will execute this job, and it will show the GPUs that are on the host. An even better way is to use device plugins, um, because device plugins can do what I did in my ugly hack, they can do it um, within the proper way. So a device plugin is able to to change the environment of a container that's about to start. He's able to mount stuff within the container who's about to start. And importantly, of course, he's able to change devices of the container that is about to start. So if I, and I create a little GPU um, plugin that allows to use the Docker engine and, and employs this to create, uh, to map in devices and map in uh, libraries um, and, and do what I did in engine, in the Docker engine, do it in the proper way by a container plug, a uh, Kubernetes plug. And this is where it lives. Um, and what it does is it's pretty simple here. It just messes with the environment, adds some stuff, and then um, the device will be used. And what I didn't show here is the device plugin will, um, will um, register itself to the kubelet. So it will say, OK, here I'm a device plugin. I see two GPUs or one GPU. Please uh, inform the management that you can schedule a job here that requires GPUs because I know how to do GPUs. And that's, that's uh, what this device plugin is doing. So a little demo, or a little, like, first a little overview. So I have two nodes here um, with one CPU, uh, GPU each, and I can trigger a, a job on both of the GPUs. And this will look like this. So I, I have this object for, for Kubernetes. Um, I, I just run a stupid Ubuntu image. Um, I request a GPU, one GPU, and I will run NVIDIA SMI L. Um, since Houdini maps in the this binary, I, I don't. I, I can just use a plain Ubuntu image. I don't need anything else. The uh, Houdini plugin will map in this binary, and it will map in all the CUDA libraries that are needed. So when I execute this, it gets completed. It gets scheduled and completed. And at the end, I can see. Okay, I have one K520 GPU. But even more, or even nicer, I think, and, we, and that's uh, timely that uh, Fede had his presentation just before, um, we can do this also as well with Arcuda, right? Um, what we need for Arcuda is we need to provide environment variables that point to the correct, uh, to the correct host where the GPUs are, and we need the Arcuda library, which is like, what was it, like two megabytes or whatever, and we need to map this into the container as well. So what I'm doing here is I mess a lot or I mess with stuff a little bit more. I provide this Arcuda device count um, variable to the container, and I add this Arcuda device 01 whatever um, environment variable to the container, and then the container will start and will have this environment variables to, to go off with. And what I did here, I had a very, as a, 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 a TU2 medium AWS node instance with, without any GPUs, but both of the GPU nodes, they use Arcuda, and this um, middle instance has a Akuda device plugin running, so it knows about the two K520s on the hosts left and right. And um, if I schedule this host, uh, this job here, I, I request an, uh, two Akuda nodes. It will be scheduled on this middle node. And when looking at the at the port here, at the container, I, I just output the env command here. I see that everything was set up so that the Arcuda client can get to work here, right? So um, 
if this would have, uh, and I just use a simple root image, if this would have the client and some, some um, application to run, it will work. And to show you <coughs> sorry, that it will work, I did this on my Mac just like before I, I came up here. Um, I work on my Mac here. I, I, I created this device query uh, image on my host with Arcuda in it. And I can execute this on my host. That's like on my laptop here, like just 20 minutes ago. Um, and I access the 2K520 um, GPUs in Amazon because, yeah, the client knows about the GPUs by, by the nature of this, um, this environment. So by doing so, you can just use Arcuda in Kubernetes. You don't have to change anything on the engine. So that's why, where I'm excited about because I don't have to five minutes. Uh, because I don't have to argue so much with, uh, with engineering, this should be a, a very transparent way of doing things. So that's something that uh, we explore and, and, and um, it seems very promising. Especially if you think about workstations in an office setting with people wanting to try GPU or CUDA, CUDA code, but they don't have access to GPUs on their workstation. You can have like a little box with eight GPUs or a couple of boxes with eight GPUs and by doing this Everyone can use his workstation, write some code, create a container, and then run Arcuda to use the GPUs on a different host. Okay, next step, um, as I said, I, I planned to do this last week, but as I was sick, it was not possible. But I want to run uh, Jupyter Notebooks using this Kubernetes and GPU or Arcuda plugins so that we can create a, a distributed scale setup for Jupyter Hub um, to, and support dedicated C GPUs. Uh, and also maybe look at Arcuda, we can do things so that everyone can run Jupyter on his workstation and run on remote, remote host. <coughs> <coughs> and of course, the shared file system issue needs to be resolved and we are working on it um, internally, but I think that will maybe take some, some more months to do so. And, and the idea here is that, I mean, we are, we are hearing in the HPC world a lot of how can we reach exascale and how can we make sure that new technologies are used and new paradigms are created so that we can reach the scale that we need to run? I would argue, and I argued it a couple of times, and, and I'm a little bit sick, so maybe I'm too direct, but I would argue just use what is already commoditized. So let's just not think about new funny ways and, and crazy ways of doing things. Just enable people using commodities, technologies like Docker um, to, to embrace HPC and embrace AI workloads, deep learning workloads, so that everyone can do a little HPC. I, um, I think this is something that is sometimes missed. So we talk about a lot of new, new technologies, but we don't leverage what's out there in the commodity land. So the call for action. Um, the problem I have is um, big HPC sites, they want a product, and our product team, they want big HPC sites to, to commit to it. So I have like a little bit of this chicken and egg problem. And uh, so if everyone would just purchase a couple of nodes uh, from Docker EE, then uh, I have like a little <coughs> bit more um, uh, lift under my wings. Um, I think what, what, we'll, what we'll see is that this deep learning use case will push it forward. And as I showed in my slides, um, this, will, this will go. We will eventually go to HPC anyhow, but if you want to foster it, if you want to fertilize it, get involved and um, maybe create a, a, a build farm and um, get to know Docker a little bit more, or get to know the ecosystem, and then you can hit the floor running. Of course, we have like all this cool stuff like scanning and, and LDAP support, and, and I know I said I, I'm not a sales guy, but there's a lot of cool stuff that you can leverage using our technology. And in the end, and this is like my last two slides, now we have this, right? The Docker engine doesn't honor shared file systems. And uh, this workload schedulers, they create processes on behalf of the user, which is the same with the Docker engine. It also creates processes of, in behalf, on behalf of the user. My idea is, and this is where actually like the, uh, the shifter and, and, and um, singularity comes place, they are just a wrapper right around the, around the process. So they are, inter they are easy to integrate into Slurm and all the others. Um, and this is what I want to achieve. Have the Docker engine be the, the piece that creates containers or creates processes. Uh, so that the workload scheduler can focus on scheduling and not on forking. I mean, everyone does forking. And I think, why, why not um, swap everything out and, and let the Docker engine um, do the trick? I mean, I'm biased. I have a Docker t-shirt, anyhow. 
And once this is done, we can also include PMI in the engine, I think, so that you can run maybe a little test job on your on your workstation to figure out MPI and, and work, around, work with MPI and get to know MPI. Uh, I talked to the MPI experts and when they when they have a workshop they, they have a USB key that everyone needs to boot into so that they have the same environment everywhere. With this you can have a, a container uh, that is the correct open MPI and the Docker engine will do PMI so that you spin up MPI ranks on your host. And then we can put in your HPC schedule as well. Perfect, I think I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely in time. Okay, questions. And I, I don't have an official roadmap, of course, um, because I don't have the, yeah, it's, it's uh, not my, it was my pay grade to, to do, do this, but internally I can assure you we are working and I'm pushing for this. And I said a couple of customers are pushing it for it as well, more the deep learning stuff than the HPC stuff, but um, we will get there. Questions? Hi everyone. So Docker is singularity. You probably get those questions. Singularity is it's the same. It's not the same, right? It's no, no. I mean, singularity is a user land container technology, whatever you call it. Uh, it, it. It swaps into existing technologies like we see here. So you can just wrap it, and you can still use the the traditional way of doing things. Um, and and we. We don't do this. We, we don't do a Docker run that is then the process that is uh, executed. It's not a user land container that we create. The engine creates a container. And But I think we can, and, and I hear the argument a lot that, yeah, the Docker engine is a root privilege process that creates processes on behalf of the user. That's not something that we, we like. And then I say, yeah, what, what about Slurm D? It's the same thing. It creates processes on behalf of the user. Of course, it's, it has a long history and it's, it's established technology and it has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, scrutiny to it. But the engine is used on million or billion of devices. And I think uh, if uh, four letter acronym guys can run on it, then um, I think we can get the same, the same security and the same trust. Other questions? And I will be around maybe a little bit because I'm, I'm sick. I think I have to leave a little bit early, but feel free to ping me over lunch. Thank you.